Me too. Amen. Glory to the Lord. Amen. Good evening, church. Good evening, Pastor. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. So we're going to start our service this evening. As we give God the praise, we sing a few songs of praise and worship, lifting up the name of Jesus. Let's sing this song together. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, amen, let's put our hands together. As we glorify and exalt his mighty name, he's worthy to be praised and he deserves all the honor. When I think of the goodness, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all he has done for me, see my soul. Holy, 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 holy,
before we try and exalt his mighty name, he's worthy to be exalted. He deserves all the honor. And let's know now as we're going to worship God. So sing these songs together that we bless your name. He's worthy to be glorified. He deserves all the honor. We bless your name. We bless your name. He said, Almighty God. He deserves all the honor. We uplift and worship you, Jesus. We praise and magnify your mighty name. We exalt and uplift you. We worship and glorify you. You're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We glorify you, Jesus. We praise and uplift your mighty name. We give you all the praise. We give you all the honor. Worthy to be exalted. Amen. Glory to the Lord. Let's bring these needs before the Lord as we pray with one accord. And let's pray for God's grace and his anointing to be upon this service. Let's pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit. God would fill this place with his power, his presence, and his Holy Ghost. Let's pray for the move of God upon new believers, backsliders, and all the saints. And we also just want to pray for the Mother Church. We pray for Pastor Sesson and the Window Congregation. And as you have your need this evening, we pray for our finances, our families, we pray for our president. We pray for the sick in the hospitals, the bound in prison. We pray for those that are lost in their sin. You pray for yourself and also pray for a neighbor. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, God, for your grace and mercy, Lord. We thank you for your strength, God, that you strengthen us to be in your sanctuary this evening. 
God, I pray for this special anointing that you anoint the service, anoint your word, and anoint thy servant, God, tonight. We do pray, Father, for we contend for the power of the Holy Ghost in this place, God, tonight, in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we pray, Lord, for pouring, God, of the Holy Spirit. We pray for Vindic Church and Pastor says and his family. God, we give into your hands, God, for more wisdom and understanding heart than the spiritual discernment, spiritual conviction and vision upon this land, upon this nation, even to the missionary in Angola, the James Road in Angola, Lord. We pray for those that are about to go to Botswana, God, in the name of Jesus, that you go before this missionary. God, we do pray, Lord, for the Dao Sheba in the Ocho, the Kaele, Lord, in the Divun, Lord. We pray for the Kaiwa, for the Kamanya, Lord. God, I pray for this men, and we bring before them to you, Lord. I pray for your grace to be sufficient. I pray, Lord, that you extend, may you touch them. Lord, we do pray, Lord, for our family member, for their salvation. God, I pray that you send more labor that they might witness to them that they might receive the word and the gospel of salvation Lord we do pray God for those who are bound for those who are in prison those who are sick God we strongly believe that you say wherever two or three gather together in your name you are in the midst of them and tonight we strongly believe that you are here Lord with the power to deliver with the power to heal with the power to touch Lord the supernatural intervention God we do pray Lord for our pastor Neville and his family Lord we pray for God provision we pray for God wisdom we pray God God, that you raise up men's key disciples, keyboard prayers, bass guitars, and all the instruments, Lord. We give you glory, Father. We're so grateful for what you're doing in these sounds. We glorify your name. We worship you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus Christ. You are worthy to be praised, worthy to be worshipped. We thank you, Jesus Christ. God, wonderful people, say amen. Men, take time and give someone a seat. Good evening, church. Good evening, church. Amen. Welcome to the Potter South Christian Fellowship Church, where Jesus Christ is alive and in the business of changing lives. Amen. Let's have the victory tonight. I've come with a lot of energy. Amen. So the building is open Monday to Friday for prayer as early as 6 a.m. until 8 a.m. You take note of that. Come out for morning prayer. Start your day with God. Amen. And then we have uh, Monday evenings, the sisters are meeting for fellowship and um, discipleship. They're meeting for a time of bonding, a time of um, um, mastering certain things. Amen. God is helping them. On, on, on the same Monday, the brothers, you are welcome in your own time, whether it's uh, catching up on your Bible reading, um, sermons, um, discipleship, and development, you take note. Then on, s on Tuesdays is... Um, Youth, amen. <laughs> Youth with Brother AJ, amen. You're, you're of a certain age, come out, don't limit yourself. 
whether you're in high school, you know, you're in your 20s, come out, amen. Be blessed by the word of God. Wednesdays like tonight, we have our midweek service. Midweek service, come refuel, come be in the presence of God, number one. Um, the building is open half past five for prayer. Um, come out, get a hold of God, set an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit, get an atmosphere of God so that you may receive what is being ministered. On Thursdays, we have our main Bible study here at church with the Nandas. Um, every Thursday, half past six, the building is usually open from six, quarter to six. You can come and pray um, and sharpen yourself in the word of God. Certain things that you don't understand, certain things that can't be explained by yourself, you come out um, in the presence of other believers and, and senior men you will, you will receive. Then also in um, C Point, we have Bible study with Brother AJ. Um, they are different. The Bible study in C Point is meant for outreach. <coughs> it's Sister Nav Vanessa's house. Sister Natasha is there. So you come for the main Bible study here in um, church. Then on Friday is intercessory prayer. Amen. You come out for intercessory prayer. You want to grow. You want to see God move in your life. Be here every Friday, half past six. Amen. Some of you have actually never been here. I've never seen you at intercessory prayer, which is the sign that something is lacking. Amen. All right, we give grace. Then on Saturday, half past eight, um, come for um, um, cleaning. The building is open as early as half past eight. You're in cleaning ministry. Whether you're a new convert, um, you want to do something for God, we always say that um, cleaning is a good place to start. There you don't, you, you don't really um, need a lot of things. It's not like worship or playing platform ministry. Amen. And then um, on Saturday as well, the Great Commission, um, 10 o'clock, we go out. Um, you have a testimony, you're saved, come out and um, win the world for Jesus. Then on Sunday, as early as 7 a.m., we have our men's breakfast, men's discipleship, um, a time of fellowship in the word, a time of sharpening, a time of um, glorifying and being edified in the word and glorifying God. Then at 10 o'clock, we have our main worship service um, every Sunday. In the afternoons, half past three, we have our hospital ministry. Then at half past um, six in the evening is our evening service. Then we have the building open half past five. So in other announcements, um, this coming month, we have revival. Amen? We have revival. Amen? So we have revival with Pastor Nathan from um, Nathan James from the UK, which will be on the 20th till the 22nd, meaning the Wednesday until the Friday. You understand? So um, you take note of that. I please pray. Look, revival is an opportunity for you to have a di diversified palate. What does that mean? It's where God will bless you in other areas, just not through your pastor. And believe me, pastor also grows weary in preparing the same sermon. You know, so us as a fellowship, we are blessed to have many people that we have, uh, actually, we are all over the world. In fact, I, I can't even stress this enough. Yes, Jasmine. Amen. So we, we're going to be blessed in the word of God by Pastor Nathan. Um, he's going to come, um, bless us in the word. Then the first of the no, first of November is our Water baptism, also take note, if you have not been baptized, you're a new convert or you have a new convert, please inform them now already. This is, this is very important. I'm sure Pastor will also be preaching on water bap baptism um, soon um, to just bring direction in that. So um, that's just all the announcements I have. Let's just um, welcome Pastor as he comes. Let's give him a clap, Pastor. <laughs> Amen. Oh, yes. Break every chain. Huh? Amen. Good evening, church. Amen. Uh, do take note the, uh, the revival with Pastor Nathan, Nathan James is, uh, is for the evening services. I, we have to note the times will be 6.30. The service will start at 6.30 Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. So, uh, amen. You hear, you find people here Thursday morning, and uh, uh, yeah. So do take note: the water baptism is the first uh, of November. Uh, so if you have a convert, you know someone who's wrote down their name. They will be repeating it anyways. But uh, just do um, if you have your convert there. Apart from just you telling them, it's the first of November. 
encourage them to come to the house of God. Amen. Amen. So let's quickly move to the second part of worship. The book of Genesis, chapter 8. The book of Genesis, chapter 8. Book of Genesis, chapter 8. From uh, So it's just, we're going to read three verses. 20, 21, and uh, 22. It's so amazing. It's the revival days. Maybe I was supposed to use this as the, as the offering text for that Wednesday, but... <laughs> Uh, so perfect. But anyway, so before we read this text, I just want to, um, I will communicate this. I will communicate this to you. Uh, I will be, we will be starting with the, uh, very soon, uh, maybe after the revival, I will be starting with a, a, a series on altars. Um, now, when you hear that altars already, it's not, it's like, it's like, it's not, a, it's not an exciting topic. It's just a, but trust me, altars is the link between your blessing or curse. You don't understand how altars, altars is a huge, huge, huge. It's like, it's the, it's the difference between walking in blessing and walking in, in a curse. So, um, we'll, I will give you a bit of it now as we give uh, why we chose this text about altars. Uh, before we read our main text, the book of 1 Kings 13. The book of 1 Kings 13. He is a man of God. Um, this is very fascinating. I just, this is just to give you how important altars are. He is a man of God. And God speaks to him to say, you need to go to Bethel. And do something there. And there's an altar there that God wants him to change something on. Now, we'll read now. It's like, why is it so important that God has to tell this man of God to go to Bethel to go either repair the altar or destroy that altar for the people of God to walk in blessing? Now, me and you would think, I mean, what's, what's wrong with an altar? Can we not just create an, our, 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 own, our own altar? How is it that... So, I will explain to you now. So, just quickly, let's quickly read the first five verses from um, uh, first four, 13. So, we're, we're not going to rush the first two verses. It says, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So I just wanted to say this. Jeroboam is burning incense. He's not a good guy here. Just wanted to tell you this. He's offering strange fires. He's offering, he's burning other things against God here. Just wanted to, to point out this statement. So verse 2, he says this. Then he cried out against the altar. Now this is the man of God. Now, the man of God comes in, and he notices when he comes to Jeroboam, he's burning incense on an altar. And verse 2, he comes in, and the man of God, he cries out against that altar. So, I just wanted to, to, to see the significance of this. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord. And he said, O altar, O altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of, of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priest of the high pr uh, pr uh, places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, this, this is a sign of which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. Because now the man of God is saying, listen, this altar that this king of Israel is burning incense it needs to break. Now, I was thinking, what is so important with this? Can you not just create another altar? There's, there's something about altars. We will see. Uh, verse 5. So, it says, And the altar also was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the, which the man of God has spoken by the word of the Lord. I, I, there's more on it. Jeroboam was so vexed he commanded this man to be, um, uh, to be arrested. He said, listen, we need to stop this man, what he's doing here. 
Because there's, there's a link between what alt, the altar in your life. It's what gives dominion or access to either God or Satan. There's a link there. Now, what I just said now, with that knowledge, now let's quickly read Genesis 8. Why does Noah, after God, uh, you know, after the flood, the first thing he does is he doesn't give an offering, but he has to build an altar. This is the first man that comes into a new earth where God cleans up everything. The first thing he does, he doesn't just give an offering. Or he doesn't, wit he doesn't, the man says, listen, he builds an altar. There's something very specific about altars. So let's quickly read our text here in uh, Genesis verse 8. 20, he says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal, of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Then the Lord smelt a, a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter or summer, and day and night shall not cease. Noah is saying, an altar, is a, we understand altar call, right? Altar actually means it's the point where you meet God. That's what altar means. Noah comes in, the first thing he does is he's establishing something in front of his kids, his wife. This is, this is what we are going to do from forward. We are establishing an altar and it's giving. There's different altars in the Bible. We'll see in the, sermon, in the series that I'll preach. Uh, there's different altars. You can go search it on your own. But Noah did something as he said, and he chose this wine offering one. And it's something very specific. Amen. Um, I spoke this, I spoke this in, um, on last Friday that I said, um, Ephrodite, the beach outside Wolfish Bay, the... Um, is the Aphrodite beach means is a Greek goddess of sexual perversion and lust. There is an altar erected in our town that we don't understand why so many sexual perversion around us. We think it's just normal. It's not normal. There is an altar erected that needs to be destroyed. So there is different altars in that way. What I mean, you think for them naming that beach Aphrodite was just because they didn't have anything in in their mind? No, they named it for a specific reason. And for some reason, why that name and the results is linked. And no one comes in here and says, I'm going to build an altar for God. And it's in this direction. And it's money. Is that in my house, in my home, with my, I'm building an altar when it comes to money, it's to God. So I'm, establish something, I'm establishing something in my life, God. I'm not going to be disobedient financially because there's something in the Bible. Ooh, I don't want to eat, eat my sermons up that is going to come, but you read your Bible in the New Testament. It's like Jeroboam made everyone sin. It's like the new king comes up, but the altars are not destroyed. And people are just continuing sinning. It's the new guy that comes up, but it's the same sin because there's an altar somewhere. But anyways, we'll deal that with the, we're going to break some altars, amen. Amen. So let's, let's give a lot of crop offering, amen, as we give to the Lord. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I've realized with God is, one of the things I realized with God is the grace of God. When something hits you, when something is opened up, when something knowledge you have been given it's the grace of god upon your life that god is saying listen i'm one of one of the one of one to one to the mic is um, one of the the horrible things of demonic altars is it keeps people in bondage 
either either poverty deep po poverty it's it's like goes from generation to generation it's either a, 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 it's like either a curse in the male blood or the female blood there's an altar somewhere in someone's life and Noah says I'm building an ark for God and it's this amen let's let's give to the Lord uh, tonight um, father we thank you tonight for your grace your mercy God I pray would you God I'm asking you God tonight would you which you bless your people, God, that are going to be faithful, that are going to honor you, God, with their offerings, God, and paying their tithes. I pray, God, would you break, God, the curse of poverty, God, and even a poverty mindset tonight, God, I'm praying by the blood of Jesus, we come against you, you, you altar, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give. appreciate all those uh, that ministered. Amen. So our, our brother Joel, he went to Kamanyab, um, when was it? Was it last weekend? Uh, so he, he went to go, uh, you know, secure their places there, rent, where they will be soon moving uh, to Kamanyab to go pioneer a church work. Amen. Um, so it's, a, it's something. It's something that I've o that I will always give credit to. That the Smiths uh, did a, an amazing job uh, for the. Apart from Pastor Steve Marshall and the family, they establish a core in this church. That that when Pastor John Shipandeni came, he just started sending them out. <laughs> Amen. So uh, God is doing something. Um, uh, this is something that those who have spiritual ears will hear. The church, it changes. You enter a different dimension when you start sending out churches. And because then you are fulfilling God's command. And obviously with that, Satan comes and attacks, but then the grace of God is always bigger. You know, he's, he's, he's losing, a, he's fighting a losing battle, but he tries you know, he forever tries, but what it does is he's, they are going to go soon, and um, every opportunity we get, uh, they mean, because preaching, you see someone's heart from preaching, and uh, so let's welcome him as he can preach the word of God, amen. Amen. Um, Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to preach. Um, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, you guys, um, you look beautiful. You look handsome. Um, I love you guys. Um, it's not easy. And, and, and you know what? It, it's, it's so funny that since Pastor Matthew got sent out, it's like, um, how can I say? It's like something was extrapolated in engineering terms, meaning it was multiplied. And now three couples out of the Wapish Bay congregation are going. And soon, um, some of these men that you see here, I'm telling you, they're going to follow suit. And what I'm saying is that some, some of the sisters, 
Because you know when, when the, the day I told my wife, I said, baby, God just spoke to me. She's like, no, no, no. It's four months, Joel. What are you talking about? No, no, no. And I'm telling you guys, I said, some of you, as you are sitting here, you want to get it married to brothers. But I'm telling you, some of the men that I know, there's a call upon their lives. Before they got married, they already knew that they were going to get sent out. And it's a conversation you are supposed to have before you get married. So it's not healthy for you as a sister to say no to your husband when there's a call of God upon that life. You are not doing justice because you are not putting your marriage in the right direction. Amen. I just felt like I needed to say that. Amen. So um, I'm going to preach a sermon tonight. Um, it, it's a very practical sermon. Um, it's actually a testimony. And if you will allow God to use this testimony to bless you, it will drive Satan out by a mighty hand. And I got this idea from Pastor Harold Warner. Now, for those who don't know Pastor Harold Warner, um, uh, he, he, he got into a car accident. Um, um, he got um, paralyzed from the waist down. Um, just uh, on his way that he got sent out. And uh, he's the leader in Tucson. And our church from Vintu got sent out from Tucson. Um, uh, the, the, as a missionary, he came to Vintu, pioneered Vintu. Um, and then he came to come preach for us, I think our first or second conference. And then he, he testified about his life as a sermon. He called it one, two, three. Um, to signify how your life can change in a second. Do you get it? So I said, um, I didn't know what I was going to preach, but God laid it upon my heart to, to share um, what happened because you are a testimony. You're, and that's why you shouldn't be ashamed of your past. I just, I just want to say that before I preach. You cannot be ashamed of your past because if you disregard your past, you will not be able to bless the next person. All right? So here we go. I started drinking in primary school. Um, we sold alcohol at home, um, and I remember that my best friend at the time was five years older than me. Now, for, for some of you, that gives you an indication that the things that I was doing at my age um, were far above. Um, if someone is five years older than you, then you know that um, as a man or woman, they are going to influence you. Amen? All right. So um, my mother moved to um, Wafish Bay with my sister at the time and my father um, to um, Wafish Bay in 1992. So some of you were not born. Um, some of you were born, but I'm a little bit old, okay? I'm in my 30s. Okay, so in 2000, um, in 2000 when I was grade 4, um, and I remember that this friend of mine sent me to buy alcohol, and it was a nuppy richelieu. A nuppy richelieu. Who knows what's a, a nuppy? <laughs> Amen. All right. Do some of, I just want to get an indication of who used to drink um, when they were, um, before they got saved. Who used to drink? No, just be honest. Who used to drink? Okay, Sister Selma, Brother Nanda, Brother Daniel, my wife. Amen. So some of you used to drink. So, so you definitely know what's a nuppy. Amen. All right. So, so let's go. And um, also in grade 7, I remember coming from the north and we stopped at the Ongwediva Trade Fair. Now, at the trade fair, um, it's a, it happens every year. And I'm sure that you are aware even till today. And imagine, um, this was in the 2000s. So you can imagine how long the trade fair has been coming up. So I was sitting there with my mother. Um, I, was, I was grade 7. And my brother, my brother is four years younger than me. And the lady came to come take our order. And she asked my mother, no, what do you want to drink? She asked my brother. My brother said, I think it, I, I don't even remember what he took. And then she asked me, what do you want? Um, and I ordered a Smirnoff spirit cooler. Now, there was storm. But I didn't like storm. I'm grade 7. I took the spirit cooler, the one with the blue label. Now, I know sisters used to like storm or women used to like storm, but yeah. So do you guys remember Smirnoff? It's back then. This is, this is 2003. Amen. 
and I'm grade seven, okay? So follow with me. And then um, the lady was a bit like, ah, this guy's grade seven. I mean, some of you, even at your age, people know you're mature. And I'm not even sure to, to say that I had height, which people would say, no, maybe he's an old guy or had beard. I was a young maniki. Then my mother's like, no, get the boy the stone, man, or the smirn off. Um, uh, don't hide anything from him. Um, if you hide it from him, he's going to do it in secret. Okay? So, <laughs> we went on. So, then, before, before, um, before I continue, let's read our, our text. Isaiah 53, verse 3 and 4. Okay? Isaiah 53, verse 3 and 4. In fact, before we even turn there, who knows Isaiah 53? Just lift your hand if you know Isaiah 53. My days. Yes, okay, we have one, we have one faithful man, amen? So Isaiah 53 is the text that you should really know as a, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's very important as we're going to read now. And you can read the whole chapter at your discretion. But when you say there, amen. Isaiah 53, verse 3 and 4, Old Testament. Okay? Can we read? It says, He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it as were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So, I want to pray before I tell you the sermon of this title, okay? Or the title of this sermon. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, I pray, let your word have its full effect, God. Let it bring forth fruit, God. God, help us to understand the revelation, God, of your word in sorrow, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to preach a message I entitled, Drowning Your Sorrows in the River of Life. Drowning Your Sorrows in the River of Life. Now, that word sorrow is my focus today. Grief, not so much. Because, look, Jesus, when he was on the cross, or b when he was praying in Geth Gethsemane, the Bible says that he came, how much? Deeply sorrowful, unto the point where he sweat was like drops of blood. Why? It was because of you and I and because of this text. That's why I'm asking you, do you know Isaiah 53? Another thing I notice about the Bible and Jesus is that most of the things that our Lord spoke about was actually words that were in the Old Testament in Psalms. Just take notice. Go, go, read, go read your Bible again. You'll notice that when, when it speaks about sorrow, Jesus, it was already prophesied in the Old Testament. Do you understand? Let's continue. Now that, now that story of the Smyrnoff was obviously in 2003 while I was grade 7. And I remember my father briefly as a child, maybe two or three times coming home to us here in Warfish Bay because he was based in Otavi. But a great percentage of that time was highlighted by my father being drunk. And him arguing with my mother quite early in the morning. See, alcohol was in my blood. It was in my environment. And it was not forbidden. Look, I'll explain. John 10 verse 10. The thief come not to this not the thief come not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I and I am come that they might have life, and they and that they might have life more abundantly. Look, my father was a drinker. My friends drank, but one of these became the biggest, but none of these became the biggest enabler. The biggest enabler was because I was not restrained.
One, two, one, two. Okay. So what I was saying is, let me just, let me just take a, a step back. I said, look, my father was a drinker. My father drank. And I said that alcohol was in my blood, in my environment, and it was not forbidden. Now, I want you to remember that I'm preaching a sermon entitled, Drowning My Sorrows in the River of Life. Okay? You interpret that as I preach. Um, and I said, the biggest enabler for me was because I was not restrained. Remember that my mother didn't say, don't do that. She said, leave him. Okay? And in 1 Samuel 3, verse 13, he says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Now, firstly, there are two sides. If you are a parent and you do not restrain your children and discipline them, you are sinning against God, according to 1 Samuel 3, 3 verse 13. You are bringing judgment upon yourself, and your children will be vile, which means morally bad or wicked. And that's what I came, became. Um, so, and I added this a bonus because, number one, you as a parent, you have the responsibility to dis discipline your children. But that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to place the blame on my mother. I'm just saying it would have helped my mother if she would have maybe tried something else. But the onus was on me when I grow older because that's what I'm trying to take you. That's where I'm trying to take you. Okay? That's just a bonus. So don't go and say no. It's my mother's fault. One of the things that we do is we place blame. You can only blame your mother for so long before God says, but what about now? You understand? Okay? All right. So let's continue. So now I'm in high school and I, and I became a heavy drinker. In grade nine, I found out that my mother and my father were getting divorced. Do you know what was the first thought in my mind? Let me go drink and drown my sorrows. I won't forget it. It happened very, very clearly. And even as I think of it now, I came into my mother's room. The divorce papers are on the bed. And it's like something in my mind entered and happened at the same time. I said, I'm going to drown my sorrows, literally, in alcohol. And that thought so became amplified because up until I got saved, I was a heavy drinker. A heavy drinker. Now, to show you how bad this was and how early it started, in grade 7, we went to celebrate my birthday in 2007. I only remember my friends getting a second bottle of nights and me waking up in the next morning in my room. I don't know, have you guys ever blacked out when you drink? You guys have never blacked out? My days, man. My days. You see there, that's, that's, what, that's what actually what I'm trying to say. That's, actually, that's good, but you see what happened in my life. And, and you'll get the messages I'm going, so just stick with me why, why I'm, I'm saying certain things, okay? Now, Proverbs 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And you know what? That was the first series of blackout in my life with alcohol and drugs at age 17. And, and guess what? My mother sang and shouted and blessed me with every time I came home. You're just like your father. Now remember the little leaven she put in the lump in 2003. Now, sh sh now has become full-blown sin, transgression, and iniquity. Look, I'm not blaming my mother. And remember to put everything in context. But the older I got, I realized I craved love especially from my father. But the man was nowhere near in my life and was never around. What did I do? Drown my sorrow in the river of pain and in the bottomless pit with many levels. Now, I don't want you to get sad as I'm preaching this. Look, your, your testimony and what you've gone through, and I know some of you sitting here, I know some of you from my past, this is just to paint a picture of how bad sometimes people are in their lives even up till today. You don't what I, to fast forward my message because I feel like sometimes when people are testifying you feel like this person, you know I feel so sorry for this person. You don't need to. There's God. Jesus Christ. 
And I'm just trying to tell you that, number one, there's a, a, a sometimes a, a responsibility that you don't understand that lies on Jesus Christ that men have when they have sorrow happening in their lives. Today I read a message about um, um, suicide. And it was after I prepared the sermon. And I knew that, that um, it was related because I've had, maybe I haven't dealt with it in depth, but suicide was definitely something that I thought, I said, ah, in a joke I can just end it all. Do you get it? But you know that me drinking heavily and doing drugs was a, a slow way to kill myself. I was heading there. So I was, uh, I was a silently depressed teenager and didn't have an outlet for my frustrations. Plus, I became more sinful in my actions the older I became because, unfortunately, the pit is bottomless. Now, why am I preaching this message? Me and my wife came up with this title one day after church on our way home. The main road to our home month end is always full of alcohol consumers. And this specific day, we saw three men with a five liter of four street. And it sparked a conversation between us. And the title I initially called it, or she said, what, what about drowning your sorrows? But you get the extra word of drowning your sorrows in the river of life. Because that's what I want you to get. You have sorrow. The Bible says in the New Testament, for the Apostle Paul wrote and he said, unless I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Look, I'm not saying alcohol is the one that caused your sorrow like it caused mine. But by all means, I know some of you have sorrow sitting here. You can have sorrow because of finances. You can have sorrow in your marriage. You can have sorrow because of ministry. You can have sorrow because of people that passed on. Relationship that you are in or not in. There are so many things that cause sorrow. But where are you supposed to take them? Okay? So, um, so yesterday when pastor told me, hey Joel, are you ready to preach? And I'm like, season in and season out. But I didn't know what to preach. So this morning I came for prayer and spent time with God and ended up crying because I was sad. Why? Certain things in my life were not working. One of One of, them was un one of them was understanding. I pray for people, for instance, a simple thing like praying for people, and the people don't get healed. When I read my Bible, it says that the centurion had great faith. Amen? I don't have great faith. And the list goes on because it mu we must be doers of the word. So, okay, what I'm saying is that um, I'm at a point, for, and, and that's what I'm saying, it's a testimony sermon. So you apply it to your life. I said, I'm going out very soon. And I came to God and I'm saying, God, um, this, that, this, that, this, that. But one thing that God made it clear to me, he said, before I can use you, I need to help you. And you have probably in your, in, in, come into your life where you're saying, God, this, um, I want to be this and I want to be that. But God says, listen, you are not even able to help yourself. There was a point in my life where, God showed me a wound that was here in my, in my heart. And when he tried to remove the Holy Spirit, it was like I was going to crash on the inside. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. And this was in 2020. And I realized, I said, man, we are so consumed always about the busyness of life. But that's also what we heard at, at, at um, marriage retreat. That sometimes you put your head like this bird in the sand and you say, the problem is not there, it will just go away. But that's not what God wants you to do. He wants to help you. He wants, to, he wants you to come to him and say, but God, listen, I'm actually struggling with this. I'm actually I'm a very angry person. Why am I angry? God, I'm not married. Why are you angry? God, I'm broke. Why are you angry? God, my mother is sick. God, and, and sometimes it's not even the other people. It's just you that needs help from God. But when you are praying, you're praying, God, I need finances. God, I want to get married. And some of you want to carry that pain into marriage. That sorrow, that hurt, that pain. It's not, you, you should really understand that sometimes God really wants to help you before he can use you. Amen? So, um, in, in, 
this acquainted with sorrow, it says that Jesus is acquainted with sorrow. Now, what does acquainted mean? Acquainted means that I know you. In acquaintance to me, the, the way I'm getting it now is that you don't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a permanent residence. Acquainted, uh, if someone is an acquaintance, it's like, oh, do you know Sister Mona? Yeah, I know Sister Mona, but that's about it. And that's what God says. He's acquainted with sorrow. Now, it, it helped me because there came to a point in my life where God started to ask me certain questions. He says, number one, Joel, you don't see me as a father. And if you don't see God as a father, you will not be able to come to really open up to him about certain things. Do you understand? Okay? I'm going a bit, a bit ahead of my sermon. So for about 10 years, since 2013 to 23, Till this year, God has been helping me with sorrow. This means I found it harder to be happy and joyous. These moments in my life were not absent, but were short-lived. And I was nearly, nearly pushing myself in work and not dealing with this. God has pointed me to this scripture at least three times this year. But only now can I reflect and say he's working to help me drown my sorrow in the river of life. And this is where I'll say it. What, what does the Bible say about the river of life? Where is the river of life? Who knows? Bible scholars, amen, it's in your belly. It says out of your belly will fl flow rivers of life. And who is, who, who is the, what is the Bible, not what, but who is the Bible talking about that is the river of life? Oh, my word, pastor, help us. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to say it. You, you, I, I'm not going to say it. You guys need to study your Bible. You guys need to study your Bible. It's actually my, my wife's favorite scripture. Okay? All right. So before I get into that, I want to mention vices that cause sorrow. Um, and I just have three here, but they are not limited to this. For me, it was an absent father, and for you, it can be an absent father or mother. For instance, when I came to God in 2015, he told me, like as I mentioned, I didn't see him as a father. It means that I always, I was, uh, for instance, um, I grew up with a mother that was very strict. So my mother used to beat me. I know I was probably a sinner, but, you know, um, when I came to God, I had this thing of God will, 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 will really chastise me, is the word, if I just sin. If I just make one thing wrong. He's just going to stand there. Bah! Hey, get in line. And I, when I used to pray, I used to be so fearful. And only God could really help me with that. All right? So, um, how many of us here filled with the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, find it hard to relate to Abba or the King or the Holy Spirit? And for instance, many people don't even know that he's a person, the Holy Spirit. They call him it. He's a, he's a man, a gentleman. I mean, yeah. Okay? So then it's abuse of any kind. Um, drugs and alcohol, sexual, physical abuse. Uh, some, some of us were beaten, and some of you were beaten with words, with words spoken over you. Or self-abuse. You know, um, it's not easy to say this. But some of you, Satan is not attacking because you attack yourself. You, you constantly say, I'm not good enough. Or you have an inferiority complex. It's still abuse, just a different form. Do you understand? And then spiritual abuse. And spiritual abuse is obviously satanic, demonic oppression, bondages of all sorts, sickness and disease. And, and why do I say sickness and disease is spiritual abuse? Because, for instance, the woman of, um, who Jesus healed, said, I lose you from the spirit of infirmity. And some spirits are caused, and it, and it said, who Satan has tormented all these years. It means Satan has tormented some of us. I'm not even going to say some of you, some of us for many years. You get it. And, it. and you now have the responsibility to come to a point where you say, no more. Okay? And I'll, and I'll get to the answer. Um, the lust is powerful, is, is as powerful as your identity. I mentioned three, an absent father or mother, abuse of any kind, and spiritual abuse. It can be even more if you can think of some of the things. Some things apply to you and others don't. 
but by all means, seek help from the living God. See, see, Pastor Setson gave me a word that changed my life, and um, it had an anointing and an impact that will never lose power. He said, don't call or text anyone when you're tempted to smoke or drink. Just cry out to God. And, and later through sermons, I got some scriptures to support this claim. Um, and Pastor, Pastor John always used to say, um, hey man, why do you always call me after you have smoked? Call me before you smoke. Do you get it? Why are you, why are you calling me after you have done the sin? Why don't you call me before you've done the sin? And, and Pastor Session just took it a step further. He said, it's time some of you learn actually how to, re- to really cry out to God. You know, as much as I'm married to my wife over there, my wife prays by herself, man. I read by my, I, we pray together, but she cannot depend on my faith. I can, I, I can pray for her, but I cannot pray for her. You get that? Amen. So, first of all, the two scriptures that support what Pastor Sisson said was this. Jeremiah 17 verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and makes flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. And then in the same chapter, um, 7 verse 7, which blessed me, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope, and whose hope the Lord is. Now, let's get to the solution. Looking at those two scriptures is that maybe, um, look, I've been to counseling before. When I was on medical aid, I spoke to um, a psy- psychologist, yes, a psychologist, and it was, it was okay, well and so, but it, it always felt me more helpless at the end of the day. I was always like, ah, so I don't actually have freedom. You're just giving me words. You know that Jesus actually works from the inside out. He doesn't work from the outside in. The world, when you, go, and I'm telling you this because um, so I'm not saying there's, there's something wrong with you taking medication. That's not a problem. I'm just saying that, um, well, for instance, when you go down, it says, we treat, God heals. When you read on that, and that's a good analogy of what I'm trying to say. You can take the medication, but that is not going to provide healing. And the Bible knows Jesus, or they call him the healer. Okay? So, now let's get to the solution. Um, l- I give you the two scriptures already. Number one is just, I'm just encouraging you. When you have an issue, especially things that are painful and things that have been traumatic and some of these things, it's good well and so to say, hey, pastor, this is what I went through. And, you know, but, but hey, man, we have a great healer. His name is Jesus. He's, he's the greatest. He's going to help you. He's going he's gonna to bless you. And, and uh, the verse I want to give you is the verse that I got, and it was preached by Pastor Calais when Pastor Calais was still assistant pastor. Psalms 23, okay, verse 3. Please turn there. I want you to get this. Psalm 23, verse 3, and, and I'm closing. This is where I actually close my sermon. Because this, uh, what I want you to understand is, is something that um, I only got probably after seven to eight years, is that what someone got the first day they walked in might not be what you will get the moment you walk in. So depending on your situation, for instance, um, I had a broken heart when I came to church. I prayed in 2013, but in 2012, I had a broken heart from the world. And it took five years for God to mend that broken heart. And for five years, um, no woman was ever good enough for me. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't trust. It, unfortunately, it, it was just not going to work. And God forbid um, I would have tried to get married to my wife in that five years. I don't know what I would have done to, to this poor sister. Do you get it? No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Some, some, some things are painful, man. Some things are you, you have no idea. And that's why I'm calling this as a testimony because... I remember when Pastor Harold Warner preached that sermon, he said, um, one of the anchors in your life have to be Jesus. And I was, for instance, I was telling my wife, I said, babe, um, you can lose anything. You can even lose your mother and your father, but you cannot lose your faith. Certain things like Jesus has to be one of your anchors. He's one of the people that you, you must say that anything can happen. But hey, man, I'm holding on to Jesus. 
And do you know what that will do? It will make him the person who you run to before you run to men. And that's why I gave you those two scriptures. You understand? And that's, that's just healthy for you. It's very healthy. It's healthy. For, I'm not saying disregard men. I'm not saying um, you cannot share. But I'm just saying don't try to find in men what God needs to do. Even if you're married, it, it, and I'm married, I'm telling you now, there's certain things I have to pray about. There's certain things that God has to facilitate. But this was more, the sermon was more based on the fact that I testified is because um, sometimes um, you, you are not going to get it out. In, um, I just felt like sometimes we, 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 we don't really understand why certain things happen. And if they're happening, you also want the solution immediately. But I'm telling you, it took five years for God to heal me of a broken heart. Then he started to deal with the sorrow in my life of the broken heart. Because what happened over those years is that I had, I, I, it's like, number one, I was angry towards God. I see God, um, I had this broken heart and I've, I've, um, I've um, given myself over to you. I'm not healed. Um, um, why is it that I keep doing the same thing over and over? And um, I said I was sorrowful also because it was like, number one, I was studying engineering. And I couldn't understand why all of a sudden my brain um, had lost the capacity to do certain things. And it was because of the condition. So all these things happen in my life, and I'm just thinking to myself, my days. So when Pastor Kelly preached this sermon that God restores your soul, as um, Psalm um, 23 verse 3 says, he says, look, what happened to me is not actually God's fault. That's also what I want you to know. It is sin that does that. That's why God doesn't want you to sin. You, you know when God, when God says don't sin, and, God, and, and our pastor preached a powerful message, he says there's transgression and iniquity. You understand? So there are levels to this. Some of us need greater restoration. And you are coming to God, and you are saying, God, no, just take this away, do this. But when Pastor Kelly preached the same, he, he put it in greater detail. Maybe I'm not at that level yet. But he said, because of the effect of sin and how much I used to drink, you guys don't understand. I, a 6,000 in two, three days, gone. And, and that's what I used to do. Now imagine all that alcohol through my liver, through my kidneys, through my mouth, through my brain, all of it. Because I mean, when you're drunk, you, you, can't, you can't function. And I told you I used to black out. Now I come to God in salvation and I want to be like Pastor Neville. No, God says, he restores my soul, yes. But calm down. Calm down. You, and I needed, and, I, and you know, the biggest thing that God kept telling us, you got to be patient. You gotta be patient. You you have to you have to obey me such that you you are in the word because the Bible say, speaks about the regeneration of the washing of the word, and that's also something that I learned. I said certain things I experienced the more I was with God every day. He he helped me to to he actually carried me because certain times I felt like my heart and my flesh failed, and that's also what the Bible says. But he was there and he said, "No, Joel, look." You were in this thing for a long time. And you know, my cousin Oscar actually repented um, in two, uh, 2000 and something. I was with him next to him when he gave his life to God. But I was holding on to my sin. Sometimes God came to you when you were a young child. In it, I watched the Passion of the Christ in grade 7. Yet I still didn't repent. I was holding on to my sin. Twice God came to me and I could clearly see that it's sin that I was holding on to. Now, when I came to God in 2013... All of a sudden, I want God to fix me, and God must just run, and all these things. And God said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Baby steps. They calm down. And so, um, you can take this message and apply it to something like your finances. You can take this message and apply it to something like your prayer life. You can take this message and apply it to relationship, because everything in God is going to take time. You get it. That's why you shouldn't rush God. Certain things God has promised you that he will do. But the promise of Isaac came after how many, how many years? 
You have no idea. It's, it's like what our pastor was saying. He says, uh, one disciple was complaining to me, no, pastor, you don't understand we have a house. Yeah, but after how many years did Pastor Jason get that house? You, you can find people who have been working, have been crying out to God for 10, 20 years. Then you come in and you just come start complaining and say, you don't understand and what. That person, I mean, Pastor never got saved in 2012. These certain things that he has gone through, he, he has been tried and tested and tried and tested and tried. He has prayed. So it's, it's really, it's really you trusting God and trusting the process because there's also a law of process. What is the law of process? God spoke to Joseph in two dreams. And then it's like he just vanished. You don't hear God speaking to Joseph. Then you hear Potiphar's wife. You hear of the pit. You hear of the jail cell. And then all of a sudden, lifted to glory. But if you had met Joseph in the palace, you're like, Tabra, you're going to be just like you. But then God says, are you willing to drink the cup that I drink? Because look, one thing I'm sure of is that there's a destiny upon your life. But because of process, we've sometimes thinking that all you're going to do is holding the mic and ministering up here. But most of the things that you see us do here is only a result of what God has done on the inside. And so sorrow is not because it's real sorrow, but it's whatever you need God to help you with today. And some of you have been running. Some of us have been running. It's depression. It's secret sin. It's whatever. You, you got to take those things to God from today and just say, listen, God, um, I'm not going to run. And, and you, know, the, you know what I've even experienced with God? It's like God will ask me, if, uh, I will come to God, and I'll say, God, this, that. God gives me an answer. But it's not the answer of the question I asked him or what I prayed for. It's what's in my heart. And God is about your heart, just like he said to David. Your heart, is, uh, number one, is desperately wicked. And number two, God says you got to guard your heart. So you got to come to God and say, listen, upon these altars, you got to say, God, listen, um, I've, I've done this, I've done that, or I'm in pain and what's on. And the thing about pain is, um, if you're not careful, you're going to cause pain to other people. Have you ever seen an angry person? It's like they want, or a depressed person, they also want other people to be depressed. No, my problem. Mm, mm, you don't understand. No, I, I don't need to understand. Just go pray, bro. Deal with it with God sometimes. So sometimes, and I know sometimes it's very hard to hear this because you don't know. But that's also the point of salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't forget that scripture. Okay, so we can, we can end here. I hope, I hope this message really has blessed you. Um, I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Um, I have not really spoken about sin, uh, and if I did, it, it was not in the light of the condemnation that God says, um, if you die a sinner, you will burn in hell. Um, this message was not to condemn you, but to encourage you. And um, if you're in this place, um, you've heard the word sin, um, you've heard that there's hell, there's heaven, you, you've heard, number one, that there's someone called Jesus you've heard of the of God but you are not in relationship you have not given your life to God you are not born again you are not um, you don't even know where to begin it starts with repentance repentance is the 180 degrees turn from the road that you are on which is the broad road and you say, God, help me to live for you. And you come on the narrow road. And like we spoke here, um, the first thing that you got to do to earn God's healing is for him to come into your heart, to be enthroned in your heart. You know, the biggest challenge for men is that he also wants to be God. And God says there can only be one God of your life. And that God is Jesus Christ. So if you're in this place and you're not saved, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand. 
Okay. And maybe you you were saved, and maybe you did, um, or you have said the prayer of repentance, but something happened. Something happened. God says, "My son, my daughter, there's grace upon these altars." Um, you can raise your hand, and you can rededicate. I will not lie to you. As a new convert, I bounced many, many times upon these altars. Many, many times. For me, in my life, I've decided that as long as I'm alive, hey man, if God is speaking to me, then I need to obey. I will not burn in hell for any man. Hell is forever is too long. Don't hold on to your sin. Don't hold on to the, the, the tugging of the Holy Spirit upon your heart. Hell is one gate, one door. And once you go in, you cannot come out. Don't resist. Don't harden your heart like Pharaoh. Don't resist God. God is saying, just come, my daughter. Come, my son. Come, my child. I will help you. Amen. So if we all serve you, saved in this place, I want you to come um, for believers. Come pray upon these others. Come meet with God. Talk to God. Talk to your heavenly Father. Cry out to the King. Let the Holy Spirit help you. He's a comforter. He's a helper. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, invade our hearts. Invade our personal space, God. Invade, God, what we have kept secret. God, help us to open these doors that we have locked in our hearts that we have called no entry, God. God, help us to be obedient to the Word of God. Help us to understand the pain, God, that you went through on the cross of Calvary, God. Help us to give you right of way in our lives, God, in our relationships, God. God, according to Psalms 23, verse 3, God, you restore our souls, God. God, you restore all the damage of sin, God. You restore the damage of transgression and iniquity, God. God, you died for us, God. God, you are the great and mighty warrior, God. You are the healer, God. You are the great king, God. God, give us wisdom to speak to you. God, inspire us, God, to lay down every pain, every weight, God. God, help us to let go of things, God. Things that bring no glory to your name, God. Glory to your word, God. God, help us to understand what you want us to do, God. God, establish us in the faith, God. God, give us the fruits of the Holy Ghost, God. God, help us to be patient, God. God, help us to trust you, God. God, help us to make you the first choice, God. Help us not to put our trust in men, God. Help us, God. In every way possible. Hallelujah. Worthy, 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 worthy. Glory to your name, Lord Jesus. We bless your holy name, my God. God, you give us grace, God. We humble ourselves before you, God. There's none like you, God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, come and be with your people, God. Put your spirit before us, God. Put your spirit in our hearts, God. Anoint us with fresh oil, God. God, help us. Help us in this place. Upon these altars, touch your people, God. God, touch your people, God. Come and dwell us amongst us, God. Make your habitation with us, God. God, bless us with the spirit of endurance, with the fruit of endurance, God. God, help us to love your word, God. Help us to love your word, God. God, we bless your holy name. We bless your holy name, God. Hallelujah. Every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, and there is.
of salvation there's an element of salvation along this narrow road that you are only going to experience the victory by contending in humbling yourself before the throne of God I'm telling you now certain things um, you are really only going to get to know God if you are really going to be a human being who needs God the, the um, it's God, the, one of the, the things that God wants is brokenness. You remember that song, brokenness, so how does it go? Yeah, yeah. It says God, God is close to the brokenhearted, to those of a contrite spirit. It means that if you hold yourself high and mighty, you know I'm doing well. And you know what? And you know what I've learned? Everybody, like Apost- the Apostle Paul, you have a thorn in the flesh. And I'm not talking about the thorn in the flesh. But look, um, some, some of us are young, but look here, I'm probably one of the oldest people here. Plus, I don't know who else is older than me. The older people left. <laughs> you get it? So, um, the older you get, God will take you through some things. And it's just not God, it's also life. But now, if you just keep fighting these things, you just keep fighting these things, you don't deal with when your mother passed on. You don't deal with when your brother passed on. That offense, that hatred that, that grew, all these things, and I'm, it's, it doesn't even have to do with church sometimes. It's just the effects of life. So take it to God and, and gain the victory because that's what Satan wants you to do. He says you come to steal and destroy. And if you allow him, he will take a small thing and he will make it fester. Have you ever seen a wound? In fact, let me tell you something. My grandmother got amputated both her legs from a small wound that we just let fester. And she wasn't taken to the hospital. That thing was not taken out. Now both legs are gone. Imagine. Alright. So I hope that message is clear. So we're just going to um, bow our heads. We're going to dismiss in prayer. Brother Andrea. Um, gives 
Moses.